Welcome back. Who says politics isn't rocket science? <laughs> it is if you are a political scientist. The people who are looking at the numbers, crunching the data, we have a group here today to really analyze what we've been doing for the past couple of months. So let's introduce a few. Sean Foreman, a friend of ours, professor of political science at Barry University. Catherine DiPaolo is a professor of political science out there at Florida International University. And here is a familiar face, Justin Safey, not really a political scientist, a political expert. He is an attorney and analyst, publisher of the Daily Safey Review. To all of you, welcome. Good morning. Glad to have you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. We are so glad that, uh, that you were here. Um, Sean, let me sort of pick up where you and I were speaking the other day, and that is, I came to see you for a little analysis after Jeff Green went off the air, and then the next day he decided to go back on the air. I mean, as our earlier guests were saying, that doesn't really inspire confidence. Not at all. Uh, I guess they got the memo that they need to be on air the last weekend if <laughs> yeah. they want to make up ground. Uh, it was interesting because uh, Green's spokesperson said, well, he didn't get to be a billionaire by by being silly or unconventional, right? He's going to save right. his money. But, you know, this whole green candidacy... Not a moment to save your money. No, this whole green candidacy is a paradox. Why in the heck is he running? What is he trying to accomplish? And I really think he just hurt the party, and he probably hurt himself in the long run. You know, in that race, there is what is potentially Florida's first woman governor, potentially Florida's first African-American governor. Catherine DiPaolo, it is, it's different this time in that race, or is it not? I mean, we've had candidates right. before. What, what is different about this race? Well, I think, you know, while we can argue the validity of some of these polls and, and who really is up or down, I think Gwen Graham is in, in the top of one of these candidates. She is a front runner. And, you know, again, I think she's learned the lessons from Alex Sink's campaign. Mm -hmm. I think you have women energized, especially in the Democratic base, to come out and vote for her. So the fact that it's sort of Gwen Graham and all the men running against her uh, is, is particularly important. Oh. You know, Justin, the, the, the fact is that among the five Democratic candidates, and we're looking at the blue-green algae goop, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but among all of these five Democrats, you listen carefully, there's not really much light between them on the on the major issues they're all pro-choice they are anti uh, nra and for gun reform legislation they're pro environment everglades restoration i mean they they agree on all the the real major issues right i mean for those for those who've watched the democratic debates they've noticed that similarity but i think they each offer something different you have chris king and jeff green they've never been elected to political office before right. so they're kind of following the footsteps of people like jeb bush or rick scott or donald trump these non-politicians running for higher office um, then you also have these two self-funded candidates as well jeff green and, and mayor levine. mayor levine who yeah. have put I mean, I think Mayor Levine has put about $20 million of his own, own money, and I think Jeff Green, $30 million of his own money mm -hmm. into the race. So I think that's an interesting dynamic. Then you have, as Glenn mentioned, possibility of a first African-American governor, possibility of a first female governor. So I think it's a really fascinating dynamic, uh, and we're going to find out soon which, which flavor the Democratic Party uh, constituency wants. And the other factor, too, is the, the role of Donald Trump in the Democratic primary. Right. I think that Jeff Green, that ad that Phil Levine ran against Jeff Green, he had some real momentum until that ad basically had him Where saying Donald Trump is a great, a great guy. guy. I think yeah. he would have actually, I think he had a very good chance to be the Democratic mm -hmm. nominee because of the money he was putting into it. But that ad really tapped the brakes big time on his candidacy. You know, and, and on, the, on the GOP side, I mean, again, you have two candidates. Philosophically, they're pretty aligned. But boy, they could not be different characters. They could not be different dynamics. And again, Donald Trump, Sean Foreman, is playing a huge role. Ron DeSantis' numbers, as soon as the president tweeted, went, tw I think, 12-point jump over Adam yeah. Putnam. And, and that's since evened out. But, but the GOP voters, they have a real decision to make here. Well, it seems like many of them made the decision if you look at the polls. And, of course, if, if Adam Putnam in any other cycle would be the clear favorite with his long experience and his ties and knowledge of Florida. But we're not in any other cycle. We're in the era where Trump has taken over the Republican right. Party, for better or worse. And that tweet and endorsement was enough. We have to remember, Trump won 66 of the 67 counties in the right. 2016 primary. Only Rubio won Miami-Dade. So we might not see it in South Florida, but the rest of the state is listening to what Trump yeah. says. And Catherine, uh, the night of, I think, the worst day of Donald Trump's presidency, the day that Manafort was convicted and that Michael Cohen 
pled guilty to campaign finance violations. The president goes out to West Virginia and mm -hmm. in a kind of rock rock'em sock'em speech says, and Ron DeSantis is my guy and he's going to win in Florida and he'll be great. And everybody cheers. Uh, I mean, it seems a little paradoxical, but he has tremendous influence. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at, uh, there was a poll that came out this morning that said you know, that Donald Trump, President Trump, his approval numbers have stayed exactly the same. So yeah. one of the worst weeks of his presidency, nothing has changed. You know, you have GOP voters that just love him. And I think DeSantis has a real chance to beat Putnam because of that support. They'll, yeah. they'll just go for whatever Trump likes. Which, which is really remarkable because I think by latest count, uh, Adam Putnam probably is outspending mm -hmm. Ron DeSantis by two to one. Right. Um, and if you would have had any other election, you said one candidate's going to outspend another candidate, right. especially with the record that uh, Adam Putnam has. He was a state legislator. He was yeah. a member of Congress, he, agricultural commissioner no, for eight years. Been, yeah. I'm, and uh, I think the latest figure I saw was uh, Putnam had something like $32 million and DeSantis had 17, and right. that huge $10 million difference or so hasn't really made a difference. It hasn't, and it's kind of, again, interesting dynamic. It shows the power of the endorsement of the president, and it shows the power yeah. of Fox News Channel let, on Republican yeah. primary let, let, let voters. Let me ask you to dig down just a little bit, uh, Justin. Um, in their last debate, which pretty good debate, I thought, mm -hmm. between uh, uh, DeSantis and Putnam, uh, DeSantis called uh, Putnam the errand boy for Big Sugar because Putnam has taken at least 800000 from U.S. Sugar and Florida Crystals and the, you know, the Big Sugar companies and millions more through PACs. Mm -hmm. But even that doesn't seem to... I don't, I, I, don't know what difference that made. Well, I think that uh, DeSantis was trying to tap into the strain of populism that's running deep in both parties, both yeah. the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And clearly by attacking him for taking money from, from the sugar industry, I think that's where he was trying to get that street cred with populists in the, in the Republican Party. Yeah, you mentioned negative ads. Boy, have we seen <laughs> fueled by millions of dollars. Um, I was on the campaign trail earlier this week with Gwen Graham, who has not really gone negative per se. And um, negative ads, Catherine DePaulo, we had talked about communicating political communications in the past. They work. They do. And um, and what Gwen Graham had said to me was, you know what, I, I think you're starting to see at the end people are just sick of those and they want this country is ready for something more positive. Do you think that's true? Well, I would agree with that. The one thing that negative ads do is depress turnout. So if that was one of the goals of a candidate, you know, certainly go negative on, on some of your opponents. And I think that's probably the hope. But I, I think just the nastiness of politics, many people are, are tired of They're altogether. They're turned off. Yeah. They yeah. are. And Jeff Green didn't offer much of a positive ad either. Mm. We, you associate no. him with very negative and negative Well, he, he was negative against Kendrick Meek in 2010. Right. He's been negative, especially regards Gwen Graham. Let's come back and we'll talk about that with our guests in just a minute. More after this break.
Welcome back. We are in the midst of a really interesting roundtable, and we are with Justin Safey, Sean Foreman, and Professor Catherine DiPaolo. Uh, Sean, let me ask you uh, about going negative. Jeff Green ran, I thought, a, a very negative and, and I think kind of an effective ad uh, against Gwen Graham and her involvement, really the involvement of her family company, the Graham Companies, uh, in this American Dream Mall. And even though 